I would like to turn our attention in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. I just want to give you a context to our whole study. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, the Bible tells us the following in verses 14 and 15. Where was that? Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. So here you see Jesus coming, and he has on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Keep a finger here, and we're going to see what, what, what the Bible speaks about as it comes to the harvest of the earth. Go with me to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, and we are going to chapter 13. What chapter did I say? 13, good. And in Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 37. We probably remember the parable. Jesus explains that he who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. Verse 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. And now it comes. The harvest is the what? Yeah, the end of the age. So let us put these two Bible verses together. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 and 15, we are told about the Son of Man coming back, and the Bible describes it as the end or the harvest of the earth. How is the harvest of the earth used in the Bible? It is used as the end of the age. That's when Jesus will come back. Now, with this understanding that Jesus comes back at the end of the age, what kind of message is it going to be proclaimed when and before Jesus comes back? Go with me back to Revelation 13. <coughs> Revelation thir uh, 14, I'm sorry, Revelation 14. And we read verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now it comes, worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Here we are introduced to what is called the first angel's message. And in this first angel, the message that goes forward to the ends of the world is that we are to worship the Creator. He who created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, He is the one that we are to give worship to. God is the only one that is due to have worship. Now, the Bible continues in, in, in verse 9. And it says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone, what is the word? Worships. If anyone worships. Who? The beast? and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead and on his head, 
he or she is going to receive uh, several consequences of it. Now, I want you to see the first angel says that we are to worship who? The Creator. The third angel message warns us not to worship the beast and his image and the mark. And we, perhaps next time I'm coming to Vasa, we're going to study what is the image of the beast, what is the mark of the beast. But now we're going to study who the beast is. Now, take a look at this. In verse 12, the Bible in this message is ending with this conclusion. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now, whoever this group are, those who have the commandments, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ, are they worshipping the beast? No. They are not worshipping the beast. Because while the world may worship the beast, and this is the Antichrist, by the way, we're going to come into that soon, Scripture says that at the end of time, just before Jesus is going to return, there will be a message going out to the world, do not worship, do not follow the Antichrist, do not be deceived, but instead worship the Creator. With this beginning, I want to start our study, because you see how important it is. God is giving you and I a message that we are to worship the Creator, but we are to not to worship the beast. Now, my friends, do you think it would be fair by God to say that do not worship the beast, and then he, he would not give an explanation of who the beast is? <laughs> do you think it would be fair by God if he would say, do not follow the Antichrist, but he wouldn't give an explanation of who the Antichrist is. Of course, Scripture has given us clear guidance and principles and teachings of who the Antichrist really is. Now, usually when I have this Bible passage, uh, you know, usually when I have a Bible study or I preach on this, Usually, I speak about Ezekiel chapter 28. We don't have time to go in there, unfortunately. But here we are de describing Lucifer, this, this perfect angel that has been created. And we are able to see where this angel went wrong. Now, this Bible says that Lucifer was an anointed covering cherub. Now, what does it mean, covering cherub? It simply means to defend. That very phrase covering in the Hebrew means to protect or to defend. Now, the question we have to ask is, where in the Bible do we read about covering cherubs or covering angels? And that is found in the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus chapter 25. Here you see covering angels. But let me ask you this. Anyone knows what is in the bottom of the Ark? The Ten Commandments. Now, listen to this. If the bottom of the box contains the Ten Commandments, and where God manifested Himself is, according to Scripture, in Swedish, in other words, the, the, the seat of grace. Now, the seat of grace is a symbol of God's throne. Remember in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible tells us that we can come as we are to the throne of grace where Christ is ministering. Now, if, this, if, the, if the mercy seat, that's the English word for it, if the mercy seat is a symbol of God's throne, I want you to follow me very carefully. If the mercy seat where God manifested himself is a symbol of the throne of God, What's the foundation for the throne of God? The Ten Commandments. That is powerful, isn't it? The very throne of God, the very government of God, is built upon His law. It's built upon the Ten Commandments, which has been revealed. Now, Lucifer is described as a covering angel. In other words, 
before the great controversy began in heaven, what was his job description? You know, if you would type, search on him on Twitter or Facebook or, or, or what, what have you, you know, loose on his job description, it would say, I'm a protector of the law of God. Wow. Let, I, I want that to sink in. Before the rebellion began in heaven, Lucifer's work was to protect and defend the law of God. Now, Bible says clearly in Ezekiel 28 verse 15, that thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. That's sin. By the multitude of thy merchandise, uh, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Do you see that? Now, according to the Bible, what is sin? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible tells us everyone who sins breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. So this created being, who was created to defend and to protect the law of God, that very law he himself sinned against and rebelled against. And do you understand why the Bible says, if you go with me to Revelation 12, 17, it discovers God's true people at the end of time, that we're going to come to that, yes. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's God's people, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who, what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why is the dragon fighting against those who keep the commandments? Because in heaven, the, 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 the rebellion, the war in heaven was about, shall we keep the commandments or not? Shall we be loyal to God? He who once was a protector of the law of God, something happened, something clicked, and he became an instigator of the rebellion, which started in heaven. It continues on planet Earth, and he attacks those who keep the commandments. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, the Bible says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne. Does God have a throne? What is that throne built upon? What is the foundation for the throne of God? The Ten Commandments, the law. So here Lucifer, as the rebellion starts, he says, my system of government is not going to be built upon God's system of government, but something else. It's not going to be built upon the law of what God says is good, but what I think is good. Selfishness. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I wish we could have time. Do you know what Paul is speaking about? The Antichrist in Second Peter, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And the Bible says that the Antichrist shall sit in the temple of God. The Antichrist, the reason why I'm doing this, because the Antichrist is just going to continue what Lucifer already began. Is the Antichrist, as we will see, is the Antichrist seeking to sit on the throne of God? Is the Antichrist also trying to sit as Lucifer tries to sit? What, what, what in the Bible does it mean to sit? It means two things. It means to rule but it also means to teach. Because when Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 26, verse 56, Jesus says that all day I was sitting in the temple teaching. So what is the Antichrist doing when he sits in the temple of God? He teaches. But he does not teach the commandments of God the way of the Lord, but he teaches what began in heaven with the rebellion. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Oh! How is the Antichrist described in Daniel chapter 11? As the king of the north. 
I wish we could have time to go into that, but I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer wanted to be like God, and so he developed his own system of government. And he, it has been experimented with on this planet for the last uh, thousand, uh, 6,000 years. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. And now we're going to take a look at who is this beast. Once again, the Bible says in the third angel's message, do not worship the beast. But that would be so unfair of God. He says, do not worship the beast, but then he wouldn't tell us who the beast is. So let us take a look at Revelation chapter 13. The Bible says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, verse 1, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Verse 2, chapter 13. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne. Here it comes, throne again. He says, I will exalt my throne. And here the dragon gives his throne to the Antichrist and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And now perhaps one of the most saddest parts of whole scripture. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Do you understand why the third angel's message is so significant? Because in a time when there will be universal deception, God calls us to stand up and say, Do not worship the beast. Do not follow the beast. Follow Jesus Christ. Follow his word. Follow what he is teaching us. So this is an artist's description. We don't know how John really saw it. But this is at least how one person saw it. And as you can see, this is a conglomerate beast. This is a beast that comprises of many other uh, animals. One of the things is the, the, the head. Did you see what it was? His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. We saw that he was a leopard. His feet was like the feet of a bear. Very good. Now, I wish we could have time to go into this. But each of these symbolisms which the Bible gives of these specific animals is crucial for us to understand the nature of what the Antichrist is. If you have time, you can go to Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, you are going to discover, for instance, how a leopard is being described. Now, how is a leopard being described? Anybody remembers the symbolism of a leopard in the book of Jeremiah? Can you say that louder, please? It cannot change. The Bible says that a leopard cannot change. What about this Antichrist? Just as a leopard cannot change, so the Antichrist cannot change. Because you see, in our time, this particular system that we are talking about, and most of you know who, who and what this system is, it seeks, to, it seeks to manifest itself as it has changed. But Bible tells us that like a leopard who cannot change, so this power will never change. And you know, you have that particular um, um, saying. So who is this beast? Who is this Antichrist? Antichrist doesn't necessarily mean someone who is against Christ, but someone who takes the place of Jesus Christ. Now, because the book of Revelation is written in a symbolic language, we must interpret the biblical symbolisms with themselves. 
You know what I tried to say with this? I do not come with my own interpretation into the text. I am going to allow the Bible to interpret itself. That's the key for us to understand who this power is. Now, let us ask, <coughs> what does a beast symbolize in Bible prophecy? And in Daniel chapter 7, verses 4 and 7, the Bible actually says, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom upon the earth. According to Bible prophecy, a beast symbolizes a kingdom. Now, remember how it looked like. It looked like a leopard. It had the feet of a bear. Very good. And it had a what? Leopard, bear, and lion. Now, for those of us who have studied Bible prophecy, those of us who are students of Bible prophecy, what does leopard, bear, and lion reminding us of? Daniel, what chapter? Seven. Very good. Daniel chapter. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven in our Bibles. In Daniel chapter seven, it is exactly these uh, kingdom or, or beasts or kingdoms that you and I meet. But you know what is so interesting? That in Daniel chapter um, 7, we are reading in verse, verse 3, And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Now who is this lion? Now you have to understand that whatever beasts we are reading about, we are reading about a kingdom because we saw that a beast symbolizes a kingdom in Bible prophecy. So, it reminds us of the statue in Daniel chapter 2. The same kingdoms which we see in Daniel 2 are the same kingdoms described in Daniel chapter 7. However, not with metals, but with, as, as animals, as beasts. Now, the first kingdom was Babylon, you remember. And it was actually a lion which represented the kingdom of Babylon. It is still holding true in the museums today. Now, let us quickly continue in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, came. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now here's the thing. This is a bear. And it, it, and it comes up with one side being over the other. Now if it comes up with one side over the other, how many sides does it have? Two. Now the next kingdom that comes with Medo-Persia, how many people groups are we here talking about? Medo, Persia. No, it's, it's good that it says it's okay. Medo, Persia. How many is that? Two. Two. Oh, no. Next time. <laughs> so two people groups. Nevertheless, here we see that it comes up with one side above the other, which perfectly resembles exactly what happened to Medo Persia, because Medo Persia, in its essence one of the groups were stronger than the other. What is interesting with the three ribs that it had in its mouth? How many kingdoms do you think Medo-Persia was conquering? Three. It's so incredible that the Bible actually says 600 BC what exactly is going to come? That's one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is a divine book. 
What is the second verse, uh, verse 6 in Daniel chapter 7? And after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Which kingdom came after Medo-Persia? Greece, ancient Greece. Now, how many parts do you think after uh, Alexander Great, who was, who was actually the first real uh, king or emperor or ruler, how many, how many places, how many parts do you think uh, Greece actually was divided into? Six. Four. Do you see what the Bible actually says? How many heads does it have? The beast had also four, four heads. And dominion was given to it. And it was because Alexander the Great did not have uh, any offspring who would inherit uh, the kingdom, so to speak, to become the next ruler. So the generals were fighting among each other and Greece was divided actually into four kingdoms, which then later on, uh, at the very end, became two. But four was the main thing, just as scripture says. Isn't that amazing? That 300 year in the future, I would say exactly what is going to happen with a, with a specific country. It's just amazing. And then we come to the fourth kingdom, verse 7. And after this I saw in the night's visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge, what kind of teeth? Iron. Iron. Now, those of us who have studied Bible prophecy, when we read about iron, wh where does it take us back? It takes us to Daniel chapter 2, because it had legs of iron. So same symbolism, talking about the fourth kingdom. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling that residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, what kingdom came after ancient Greece? Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is perfectly uh, aligning with the biblical description of what Bible prophecy actually says. And then if we would have more time, we would be able to see that these ten hordes, that, that the Roman Empire in the western part of the world actually divided itself into ten parts, ten hordes. It's so amazing. It's so wonderful. 2,500 years ago, Bible prophecy in Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7 told us exactly what would happen in ancient history. Oh, this is interesting. Let's go back. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And now it comes, we, dis we, we read about Rome, but we do not need to read verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn. So which are the, which are the horns he is considering? I was considering the horns. How many? Ten, very good. I was considering the ten horns, and he says, there was a, another horn. How many horns total? Eleven. Huh, next time. So he says, I considered the ten horns, but wait a minute, another horn is coming up, verse 8, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I mean, there is so much symbolism in this that it's unbelievable. I'm not going to explain anything here. We are just going to allow the Bible to explain itself. In the same chapter, Daniel receives an explanation by the angel. And he says in verse 23 to 25, the following. Verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast, which is the fourth beast? Roman Empire. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, 
which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. Now what do kings have? Crowns, and they rule over a kingdom. So the ten horns are also ten kingdoms. The ten horns are ten kingdoms who shall arise from this kingdom, which is the from this kingdom. The fourth, the Roman Empire. So these ten kingdoms, they will come from the Roman Empire and another shall rise after them. This is key. It doesn't rise with them, but it rises after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So those three kingdoms are going to be completely destroyed by the little horn, by the Antichrist. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So there are so much characteristics and explanations in this, in this part of the world. Now the historian Gratan Guinness writes down that when the Western Roman Empire fell at the time of the fall of Romulus Augustulus in 476 AD, he was the last emperor, these were the kingdoms which came as a consequence of the Roman Empire. The Lombards, the Franks, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Heruli, the Suves, the Huns, and the Saxons. How many? Ten. What did Bible prophecy say? That the fourth kingdom shall be for ten kingdoms. Absolutely amazing. And this is how it probably looks like. We don't know exactly how it looked like. But here we have the Anglo-Saxons, the today, Europe, today England, the Franks, today France, the Germans, and here you have the other parts of, 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 of the then fallen Western Roman Empire, ten in all. But what did Bible prophecy say? A little one shall come among them and after them. So let me ask you. If the Western Roman Empire fell at 476 and Bible prophecies say that the Antichrist will come after the Ten Kingdoms, does it come before 476 or after 476? After, of course. So, so here it is, the little horn. <laughs> I like that picture, it's a little horn. This is the Antichrist. I want to give you 11 characteristics of who this power is. It comes from the fourth kingdom. It comes from the Roman Empire. So in a sense, it is Roman. It comes up among the ten kingdoms. It comes up after 476. It's a little horn. The kingdom is little so to speak. So it cannot be a United States. <laughs> it is little. It plucked up three. These out of the ten kingdoms, three of these kingdoms, it will completely destroy. It has a human leader. You know why we can say that it has a human leader? Because the Bible says, that this horn had eyes like a, like a, like the eyes of a man and the, and it had mouth speaking pompous words it has a human leader so there is someone who is behind this 
One is different from the others. It speaks blasphemy, the Bible says. It persecutes. It changes God's law. And it rules for a specific time. So the, the remaining time, we are quickly going to go through these characteristics. As I said, it's coming up from the fourth kingdom. The Antichrist must come up from the Roman Empire. It must come from the Western European part. It cannot be Asian. It cannot be Middle Eastern. It cannot be American. The Antichrist must come up from Europe, from the Roman Empire. It will come up among the three. Here you have all the Bible passages. The Bible says that it plucked up three. We're going to come back to, to these three. Because if we study history, this power actually completely destroyed the heralds, the vandals, and the Ostrogoth. So it makes it so easy to identify who this power is. It has a human leader. It is different. It speaks blasphemy. Um, let's go there quickly. John chapter 10. What does it mean to blaspheme according to the Bible? You know, now people use blasphemy in all kinds of manners. But what's the biblical definition? John chapter 10, verse 33, the Bible says, The Jews answered Jesus, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself what? God. So blasphemy in the Bible is to claim that although you are human, you are divine. You are God himself. And so the Bible says this power blasphemes, which means that this power is going to say that we are God on planet Earth. Do you see where we are headed? Do you already know what power we are, we are talking about? Now there is, I think, a second definition. And you can find it in the Gospel of Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, we read about the second definition of blasphemy, which says, that if someone can forgive sin or claims to forgive sins ma makes blasphemy so someone who claims to be god and someone who claims to forgive sins is making a blasphemy it's a persecuting power it's going to attack christians it will seek to change god's law who was the first one who wanted to change God's law? Lucifer. Lucifer was the one that wanted to exalt his throne. And it rules for a, spe a specific period of time. Now, who is the little horn? Now, once we are taking a look at these 11 characteristics, my friend, it becomes obvious what power we are talking about. It actually speaks about the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I must be very careful here with you. This is not an attack on Catholics. And this is not an attack against Catholics. There are so many wonderful and beautiful Catholics who are living upon this planet and who worship Jesus and who worship God according to the best of their knowledge and according to the light which God has given to them. This is not an attack on a particular group of people. Instead, what the Bible is warning us about is that there will be a power in the last days which is going to become so powerful that it is going to cloak itself in religiosity, 
is going to cloak itself in Christianity and in the name of Jesus, it will try to unite the entire world. And the Bible clearly says, do not worship the beast. Do not follow the beast. Do not marvel of the beast. And so here we are speaking about a system. A system that has gone so far from the Bible. A system that has gone so much against the teachings of Scripture that it simply speaks about as the little horn, as being the Antichrist. So let's quickly go through. Roman Catholic, I mean, Catholic, what, what, what is the name? Roman Catholicism. It comes up from Rome. Did you know that what I'm teaching you is what the church fathers also taught? <laughs> Let that sink in. Take a look at, for instance, Tertullian, who died in 220. So he is still 250 years from the fall of the Roman Empire. And take a look at what Tertullian said based upon prophecy. He said that what obstacle is there but the Roman Empire state, the falling away of which, by scattered into how many kingdoms? shall introduce Antichrist. Wow! 250 years before the Roman Empire even falls, church fathers are studying the Bible and they are saying, wait a minute, Rome is going to fall, Rome is going to be divided into 10 kingdoms, and sometimes among and after those kingdoms, the Antichrist shall come. So I'm not coming with a new interpretation. This is not the interpretation of Sebastian Matula. This is the interpretation which has been consistent in Christian theology for more than 1500 to, to, to 1600 years. It goes back all the way to the early church. Now take a look at this. It comes up from the fourth kingdom. The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifex Maximus, which the Emperor, the Caesar had, it was the Pontifex Maximus, it was the bridge builder between the gods and the, then the people of us, the, 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 the dead people, so, so to speak, the, the living people. This, the Caesar was the medium between the gods and us. And now, who else has that same title, Pontifex Maximus, was continued in that of the Pope. So it comes from the fourth kingdom, but it continues also as the fourth kingdom. The Roman Empire, my friends, is continuing <laughs> in Catholicism. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs, that is, the bishops or the popes in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. I love that. He gave his seat. What did Revelation chapter 13 verse 2 say? He will give his power, his seat, his throne, and great authority. So, do we see that it comes up from the fourth kingdom? The answer is yes. What about coming up among the ten? Well, I mean, this is where you have the Vatican. It does come up from what we would call the western part of Europe. What about after 476? Now, here, my friends, we have to recognize something. Catholicism has existed since since the 2nd century. 
probably even earlier than that. But that's not what prophecy is interested of. Prophecy is interested in a political system. In other words, when will the, the, the Roman Catholic Church receive political or sovereign authority and power? That's the whole question. It comes up after 476. This is a, a, a date which we will come back to, 538 uh, AD after Christ. Take a look at this book. AD 538 was the year when the Ostrogoth collapsed. Did we already discover that the Ostrogoth was one of the three horns which this power would destroy? And that was actually the time when the papacy received sovereign power. It was out of the smoking ruins of the Western Roman Empire and after the overthrow of the, what? Three Aryan kingdoms that the Pope of Rome emerged as the most important single individual in the West. When? 538. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Are you excited about Bible prophecy? This is amazing that the Bible 600 years before Christ would actually say that this is exactly what this power is going to do. It became the head of a closely organized church with a carefully defined creed and with vast potential, what is the word? Political influence. Dozens of writers have pointed out that the real survivor of the ancient Roman Empire was the Church of Rome. It perfectly aligns into what Bible prophecy says. It will come after 476. The papacy's power became supreme in Christendom when? 538. Due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian. Church historian call it the Justinian letter or the Emperor's letter. Which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. 538. That's the starting point for this power's reign. So, it's a little horn. It's a little kingdom. Well, did you know that the Vatican is actually the smallest, one of the smallest kingdoms in the entire, wor in the entire world? It's just 40, 44 hectares. <laughs> it's not that big. So, it is a perfect, it's a little horn. The Vatican City, an independent state, under the absolute authority of the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Anybody who knows what kind of system of governance is in Vatican? Church and state. It's a theocracy. So when the Bible speaks about the image of the beast, which I want us to study the next time we come, what is the image of the beast? When you see yourself in the mirror, who do you see? You see yourself. So the Bible says at the end of time, the image of the beast, something or someone who resembles what the papacy is, will come up, church and state. It is an enclave within Rome, Italy, with an area of 44 hectares, or, or 109 acres. It's the smallest independent country in the world. Vatican City was established in 1929 under terms of the Lateran Treaty. It plucked up three. Have we not seen that it has done that? We were reading that it plucked up the Herus, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure, I need to go back to, to do my own, to do my own reading, 
what you see, most of the things that we know about these uh, tribes or these, um, how, how could we call it, folk group, it's, um, yeah, let's call them groups, okay? <laughs> is that many if not all of these uh, of the writings were actually burned up by by the Catholic Church so the only thing we know about these heretical groups is what we know from the Catholics themselves which we know is quite a bias isn't it but did you know that some of them were Sabbath keepers some of them kept the Sabbath they were not only that they, they did not accept the divinity of Christ, as some as the Catholics argued, it was so many other things. Will history repeat itself? Will this power once again regain its power which it had before and start to persecute? Now, human leader, remember what does the Bible say? It had eyes like of a and it had a mouth. Does, it, does this power have a human leader? We call him Papa. We call him the Pope. It, it is different. Why is it different? Because it is church and state. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see. Therefore, inevitably resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. Blasphemy, we have already discussed about blasphemy. Remember the two definitions? Claiming to be God and claiming to forgive sins. Now, do we, do we find that in this power? Now, a Jesuit by the name of Joseph de Harp wrote this. And anytime a Jesuit writes something, he receives the blessing of the leader of the Society of Jesus, even known as the Jesuits. Does the priest truly forgive the sins, or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. So, do we have in this system people who are forgiving people's sins? Yes or no? The answer is yes. And what are they doing by the biblical definition? Blaspheming. It is a perfect definition of Pope Leo the 13th said we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty so not only is it trying to forgive sins but it is to claiming to be God and you know they have not changed remember that this is a leopard beast and when the Bible describes a leopard it cannot change some people think about Roman Catholicism and say that this is how it was before, but now it has changed. Oh no, the priest stay, the priest still forgives the sins of the sinner. And I'm going to show you soon that this system still claims to be God on this earth. They call the priests. Altor Christos, which means another Christ. What's the definition of Antichrist? In the place of. So here you have leaders who are standing in the place of Jesus Christ. It's the, it couldn't be any better definition of Antichrist. Altor Christos. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. Is it trying to take the place of Jesus? That's really amazing. The Pope is the infallible ruler. Who is the only infallible? God. 
So when they call themselves infallible, they are actually saying that we are God. The supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by no one, God himself on earth. Wow, that's remarkable. And I like this picture. You know, here he is, the automatic confession machine. You can choose how much you want to be forgiven for it. Seek where you will, through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner. Listen to this. A created being forgive the sinner who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Is it taking the place of Jesus? Is this power sending, is this power saying, go to Jesus and ask forgiveness for your, for, for your sins? Or does it say, come to me and I will give you salvation? The Bible tells us, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible doesn't speak about me mediators, only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now this is a remarkable picture which you see here. What is he sitting on? Who, who, is, who is the one that he, here? Who is this guy? He is the Pope. What is he sitting on? He sits on a white throne. Hmm. But it becomes even better. He sits on a white throne. And what does he have next to him? Two angels. Does that remind you of someone who also sits on white throne? Who has two covering cherubs next to him? Wow. You know, as you know, they say that a picture speaks more or louder than a thousand words. This is actually it. What is the Pope actually trying to to what kind of message do you think he's trying to send? He is God on planet Earth. Sitting on a white throne, sitting in between two angels. Just as God when he manifested himself between two angels. And it becomes even better. Because it's not only two, how many people around him? Four. In Revelation chapter 4, how many living beings is around the throne of God? Four. That's remarkable, my friends. Has it changed? Has the system changed? Because it's a leopard. It's a persecuting power. Do we do we even do we even need to go into this? Everyone knows that the Roman Catholic Church exercised such a power that they persecuted anyone who did not uh, follow them. That the church this is a British historian that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Some historians are even saying that around 50 million people were not only persecuted but were killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, every time I think about the martyrs, I'm getting, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm inspired because I'm thinking to myself, the problems I am meeting today are nothing in comparison to the problems they are meeting. What are my problems in comparison to theirs? I mean, they were going to be burned on the stake. And here I am complaining. I am influenced and I'm inspired every time I, I, I read about these powerful martyrs 
who were lived. And if you have not read that book, Great Controversy, if you have not read about these Christian martyrs who, even though they were threatened, they stood up, read that book, The Great Controversy, because it's a powerful book. Changing God's law, we are about to end. Changing God's law. Has it tried to change God's law? The Pope has power to change times and to abolish laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. The Bible says it will seek to change times and laws. When we go to the Converse Catechism or the Catholic Doctrine, we come to re realize that what is the second commandment? The second commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is that really so? What is the second commandment? You shall not have idols. All throughout Jewish uh, history, it was the ten words. The, it was the Ten Commandments. And even within Christian uh, thinking, the Second Commandment has always been the commandment of idol worship, which is forbidden in the Bible. When they say that the Lord thy God in vain, that's the Third Commandment. So what happened to the Second Commandment? Well, the Bible tells us, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down to thyself to them, nor serve them. That's the second commandment. What did they do? They simply removed it. They simply took it away. What is the Sabbath day? Question. Saturday is the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church. Sabbath is Saturday. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Because the Catholic Church transferred solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Can it be even clearer? Can, can it be more clear? It will seek to change times and laws. Fascinating. It says, perhaps the boldest thing the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed not from any direction noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Now listen to this. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. This is a Catholic source. They say, if, if you want to stick by the Bible, become a Seventh-day Adventist and keep the Sabbath holy. Wow. So as you see, the law has been under attack. Ever since the rebellion in heaven, the law has been under attack. Remember, it took away the second, it changed the fourth, and the, then the last one they divided into two. This is in Hungarian, we can jump over this. It destroyed the second commandment, it changed the fourth commandment, and it divided the Tenth Commandment. And what about the time period? This is when we are going to end. Go with me to Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and we are going to read in verse 6. Then the woman, speaks about God's true church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God 
that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now go with me now to Revelation chapter 13. And we are going to read in verse 5. <coughs> and he was, speaks about the same Antichrist power, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority for how many? 42 months. It's the same time period. 1,260 prophetic days is the same as 42 prophetic month. Now with this understanding, we go to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 25. And I'm reading the last part of verse 25. It is going to rule for a time and times and half a time. It's the same time period. 1,260 days is the same as 42 prophetic month, which is the same as time, times, and half a time, or in Swedish, tid, tider, och en halv tid. Now you see, in Babylonian uh, thinking, we can discover this in Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we read that the king was a little bit crazy for how long? Seven times. But seven times is seven years. Because it speaks about a literal year. So when it speaks about this kingdom, time, times, and half a time, one year, two years, and a half year, which makes it three and a half years. So one year, two years, and a half year makes it a total of three and a half years. Let me ask you, who else who lived on this planet ministered approximately three and a half years? Jesus. Jesus as the Messiah also ministered as three and a half years. So also the Antichrist who seeks to take the place of Christ rules for three and a half prophetic years. Now you see, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We can read this in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. We can read this in Numbers chapter 14 verse 30, 34. I could give you a tons and tons of passages where in a Hebrew mindset, when it describes either a being or a political kingdom, it is actually using the day-year principle. So, 1,260 1, prophetic days, according to day-year principle, how much does it become? 1,260 literal years. <coughs> And that is what you actually find. In one th you remember, it began in 538. And you add up 1,260. And what year do we come to? 1798. What would happen in 1798? In 1798, the general, the French general Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Isn't that amazing? Just as Bible prophecy says in 1798, this power is going to cease to exist. You have the fulfillment right there. However, the Bible says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. But how does it continue? And all, and it will heal, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. 
May God bless each one of us as we continue to study. Next time I will come. Because now we have a good foundation of how and what the Bible actually says on this issue. Do not marvel after the beast, but do marvel after Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.